Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture. Um, before I get started, I just I have a few uh, statements to read. And um, so the first, uh, I want to have a Lenape land acknowledgement. Tonight we gather in Lenape Hoking, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their traditional territory, elders, ancestors, and future generations, and in acknowledging as a school that Columbia, like New York City and the United States as a nation, was founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. GSAP is committed to addressing the deep history of erasure of indigenous knowledge in the professions of the built environment generally, and in the Western tradition of architectural education specifically. With this, GSAP commits to confronting these institutional legacies as agents of colonialism and to honoring indigenous knowledge in its curricula. Thank you. Um, so tonight, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to make the introduction and be the responder uh, to Wona Ix of Productora, who is here tonight as the Kenneth Frampton Endowed Lecturer. Uh, the Kenneth Frampton Endowed Lecture was inaugurated 11 years ago in recognition of his 80th birthday with initial leadership from Stephen Hall. Now more than a decade later, where Professor Emeritus of Architecture, Kenneth Frampton, celebrates his 91st birthday in a few weeks on November 20th. The lecture has previously been given by architects such as Grafton Architects, Angelo Bucci, Eduardo Suda de Mora, Ijoy John, Lakatana Vassal, uh, Kan Jian Ju, Yu, and Marina Tasbom, and Tatiana Bilbao. So we are pleased to welcome Woni Ix to this illustrious list of great architects, and we thank and appreciate all the donors who have made this series possible. Uh, tonight, Woni Ix will give the talk. Um, Woni is a celebrated architect, uh, well regarded amongst his generation. And um, his background includes studying civil engineering and architecture at the University of Ghent in Belgium and the ETSOM in Madrid, Spain. He, can, sorry, he continued his studies with a master's degree in urban studies from the Center of Metropolitan Studies, CMET, at the University of Guadalajara in Mexico. In 2006, he founded Productora in Mexico City together with Abel Perez, Carlos Bedoya, and Victor Hane. Productora has received many awards for their work, including the Mies Crown Hall's America's Prize for Emerging Architects and the Oscar Niemeyer Prize for Latin American Architecture. His office has also um, participated in more than, it seems, uh, 15 international biennials, um, as well as um, being part of uh, numerous exhibitions uh, and lectures. Um, among the many uh, publications from the office, the first monograph by Arkeen in 2010, and also with the prestigious Chichi monograph in 2014. Uh, they recently finished Being the Mountain, a book on the relation between modern architecture and topography with ACTAR and IIT. Uh, Woni Ix has taught architecture and urbanism at several universities in Mexico, as well as Harvard GSD, IIT, UCLA, Rice, and Princeton. He is founding director of Liga Space for Architecture, an independent platform that since 2011 stimulates an in, in, interchange of ideas and investigation on contemporary Latin American architecture in Mexico City. He has been part of Arkin's editorial board since 2010, is an AIA international associate, and serves on the board of directors at the Architecture League of New York. Moni is also a professor this semester uh, at GSAP. And with that, I'd like to welcome you to the podium. Thank you, Hilary. Now that you named all these uh, things, I, I, I kind of understood I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about very little of things. I mean, I have to leave a lot of things out of the out of the discussion. Um, I don't know. Um, I would like to thank as well uh, Dean uh, Amal for the invitation, not only to lecture here tonight, but as well to to teach at Columbia. I'm, I'm really enjoying being back. A wonderful group of students as well to be teaching back uh, in person. Uh, and Hilary, again, thank you for the introduction and for uh, joining me afterwards for uh, the talk. 
Uh, it's a real honor for Pro Torre uh, being here tonight to deliver this year's Kenneth Frampton Endowed Lecture. It's an impressive and much admired list of people that precedes us. I must say I was never really consciously aware of Frampton's writing and theory when I studied architecture in the late 1990s in the University of Ghent. But I did have this one professor who was always showing us the work of Louis Baragan, Sisa, Alto and Hudson. So I think one way or another, it must have had an influence on what, I, what we're doing today. Apart from those uh, uh, foreign architects and maybe from Rem Kolas or Kulhas, as you say here, who came to disturb our provincial quietness once in a while, we were mostly embedded in a pretty regional Flemish Central European cultural environment. And so, as um, Hilary mentioned, in an attempt to broaden my view on architecture, I applied for a scholarship in 1998 and moved to Mexico to study a master's degree in urban studies. So basically studying urban anthropology, uh, urban economy, urban sociology, reading and writing on the city. So eliminating a few uh, forts and backs. Uh, yes, you can put my partners on there, that's fine. Uh, Eliminating a few fort and backs between Europe and the Americas, uh, it is then that I met uh, my three partners. Two are Mexican, one is Argentinian, and about 15 years ago, we founded our office, uh, Productora. And since then, we've been working and making architecture together. And so I will give this lecture not only uh, on behalf of myself, but on behalf of the four of us. Uh, as the built project really takes up a central place in our in our practice, I prefer to immediately jump in and to start talking about uh, projects. I'll talk about uh, about nine different projects uh, um, in the lecture, and so I will have to be relatively brief, and I will only talk about specific fragments and bits and pieces of these projects, while of course allowing uh, leaving out the full the full complexity. The first project uh, I would like to talk about is the cultural center in Terban Solko. Um, it's a, a, a cultural space in Cuernavaca, a competition we won together with Isaac Broid in, 19, in 2014. Uh, basically, basically, we were asked to build a 2,000 uh, seat auditorium uh, in front of an archaeological site with a 14th century pre-Hispanic pyramid. And actually this was our site. There was already an existing steel structure where they would host events and they wanted to redo this uh, and convert this into a, a new state of the art um, auditorium or like a sort of theater space. Um, so if you look at, the, at the, the existing pyramid, it's actually a really interesting structure. It's actually one of the few uh, structures with a sort of a twin staircase. Uh, and if you look at what happens on the inside, uh, you see that it's basically built in, in a sort of a layer. Time over time, different layers are added in every new uh, moment uh, of, uh, of, 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 of cultural celebration. They would add a new layer on top of that same pyramid. And we find it really interesting to think architecture, both, both physically and metaphorically, as a, as a sort of continuum that builds on a previous architecture. And this idea of historic continuity is something that will come back once in a while in the, in the lecture. So for this project, we used a very similar strategy. We basically used the foundations of this existing um, auditorium, of the existing steel structure, and we kind of prolongated it, creating this, this triangle that just nearly fits onto our building site. We, we knew that we really wanted to use the existing foundations uh, because if we managed to win this competition, and so if we would have the chance to build our first larger public building, we didn't want to lose that opportunity uh, discovering some uh, uh, archeological uh, leftovers while excavating, because that would mean that we would have to close the building site at least for, for several years. So basically what we did, we used this existing, so we basically used these existing uh, 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 foundations and the rest of the construction is built by just pouring a slab of concrete uh, on the existing ground floor. Another thing that we found uh, uh, problematic is that this existing building was actually not really well aligned with the pyramid. So there was a sort of 
problem between axes is that we found kind of formally uh, annoying. And we said, how could we maybe, uh, so basically what we did, we kind of included a smaller triangle on top of this, this uh, larger volume that slopes down toward the side and this smaller triangle kind of exactly finds itself in front of this existing pyramid. So what you then see on the, on the competition rendering of the competition images is a sort of volume, sort of foyer, sort of opening of this building that directly relates a little bit to the, to the proportion and to the mass and the volume of the existing, existing building, creating a sort of dialogue between two different moments in time. Um, that's going to work. So here you see a little bit how the auditorium is organized. It's a big, uh, it's a, it's a, this, the, the theater space underneath uh, the main, um, in the center of this large triangle and a sort of large foyer space here and a smaller foyer here, both giving access to this, uh, to this different, uh, to, the, to the theater space. Same thing uh, from above. So it's really important for us to understand how this, uh, how this, uh, this the design and the geometry, the specific forms are often not kind of invented or proposed or designed by the architects, but they rather are discovered during a design process. They're unearthed, uh, distilled out of the complexity of a, of, a, of a certain design brief or out of the complexity of the site uh, of the environment. And so in this case, the, the reuse of the existing foundation, but also search for kind of a clear geometry, robust, clear geometry in dialogue with the existing pyramid um, generated that specific organization. Uh, I'll click you a little bit uh, through these different uh, spaces. The clicking is going a little bit slow. The smaller foyer and then the main the main space underneath so it's actually not really a theater space in the sense it doesn't have a theater tower it's like that's why they call it an auditorium space uh, but basically they use it for all kind of activities from music uh, to dance theater etc and then of course that direct relation uh, between these different these different elements so and apart from the design brief to make this thousand seat uh, theater space we, we 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 think we should ask ourselves always what else can we Add, or how can we add quality to the urban to the urban space? Building is is very expensive. It's for, it, it's an enormous investment of time and energy and money, and so uh, public money in this case. This is a public building, um, so it's paid for by taxpayers, which gives us as architects another uh, uh, important responsibility, a civic responsibility. So the final question would then be like, how can we make uh, this space, this area of the city better now that the building is there and what is different between the building today than, than before. And um, better not just in the sense for the users for the building, but for the city in general. And I think this is a very, very high and very difficult ambition. And often architecture has very little um, agency over the surrounding over or little ability to influence beyond these lot lines. But I think it's still I think it's still an ambition that we should always try to, to keep on the forefront of our thinking. Um, the second project uh, that I would like to show is, uh, uh, is actually the story of our office space. Uh, we we uh, used to have an office space in this beautiful mid-century office building by uh, Agustin Hernandez and Juan Soto Madaleno. And uh, after the 2017 earthquake on the 19th, September 19, um, we, although the building was later declared stable and safe and sound, we got so scared about the way things moved and the way our office was that we decided to, to, to move to a, to a different space. And every time an earthquake happened in Mexico City, there's a whole movement of people that changing, uh, people that want to live in lower, lower floors or other people that finally have the opportunity to, to get a place in, in a building that is declared structurally sound, um, but that is then um, uh, available at lower rates. You know, so it's, it's every, after every earthquake, there's a whole move of people. And so in this case, it was not only us, but also several friends that were looking for new office spaces. And we had a good friend who owned an old textile factory in, in, in the center of the city. 
And he always wanted to do something with that space, wanted to turn it into sort of creative office spaces, creative production spaces, but never found the right moment to start this project. And at that moment, uh, uh, this, this friend, Alberto Kritzler said, okay, let's do this. Let's, let's start working on this project. So we immediately moved in, uh, in, in, it's a little bit of a mess as you could see, but we immediately moved in uh, with our office. Uh, uh, using one of these bays to, to kind of uh, uh, accommodate our, our, our people and our models, uh, uh, model workshop. And um, like the previous project, it also really tells a sort of, tells a story about, about uh, time and temporality. We started then thinking together with the owner how we could continue working on this project and, and kind of understand what could happen with the central patio and how that could become a sort of a key organizer of the space. And um, it's a narrative about time, not only because it, it is of course adaptive reuse, so you put different uh, architecture of different moments of time together, but also because it was, and it still is a fantastic opportunity to, to design uh, on the go, to be able to mold and shape the space slowly, to add more and more people and different uh, partners in this project uh, over time step by step, understanding simultaneously the, the, the opportunities uh, this building offers. So we're slowly, while inhabiting, uh, rebuilding uh, this building. And it's very important to understand that projects like that um, are only possible in when financial gains or like the fast return on investment is not at the center of the equation. Um, is actually our actual office space. When a project is not steered by what Raul Merodra called the impatient cap capitalism, Alberto Chrysler, the owner of this building, who guides this project, understood that to create something valuable one way or another, um, um, you have to, uh, to make something that's meaningful, meaningful over time, time. It also requires to invest in, in interpersonal relationship, to adjust it over time, to expect maybe slower returns and to build this space in the city as a, as a social, social cultural project. A third project is something completely different. It's a luxury beach house, beach house in the south of, in the Caribbean part of Mexico. Um, still here again, there's a sort of notion of time I would like to talk about. Uh, the building was cast completely in uh, blue concrete is basically is the battery maybe almost finished i really have to click it hard um the the building was cast completely in uh, blue concrete so concrete with a blue pigment added into the mass and the provider told us not to use the coloring as it was unstable it was not designed to be used in exteriors as a natural and organic additive the experts would not be able to predict how it would react in direct sunlight um, towards the salinity of the air or in exposure to the elements. It was change you over time. At the studio, we really liked the idea to work with this unpredictability and the client, a young creative mind, uh, immediately supported it. The blue structure was raised in the jungle located be between the sea and the lagoon underneath the Caribbean sky. This is a house with walls that reacts according to their exposure to the sun and to their position within the house, generating a chain, a range of tones that go from the blues of the sea to the, to the pinks of the sunset. The project that uh, Hillary, you know it because you've, you've worked on this, is a, a, opposed to this previous luxury villa. This is a small, a low budget housing prototype in, in a, a two hour drive from Mexico City. Um, and uh, 32 architects were asked to, to develop one of these prototypes that could later, could be tested there and then implemented in Mexico City. And uh, Hillary and Michael from, from Moss Architects did the, the master plan for this project and also designed this beautiful kind of learning and welcoming center at, uh, at the entrance. Now the proposal that we, that, uh, that we made uh, adheres uh, strictly to the financial constraints. So it's really uh, a sort of very, basic uh, elementary uh, uh, architecture that 
out of base, 3.2 meter wide base, very simple rooms and a sort of central vaulted space that would uh, avoid any need for circulation or central halls, sort of flexible space in the middle that would create connections between the different, between the different rooms. A space also with a higher ceiling height, uh, a space with more generosity and a sort of uh, uh, yeah, generous outdoor living space. And this, this space that can be later enclosed or used in, in a variety of different ways, giving uh, the whole, uh, the same house a sort of flexibility according to the use. Here you can see the interiors are very basic, like very simple uh, uh, bearing brick wall system, um, uh, relatively minimal uh, uh, sizes. But then this expansion in this uh, central central space. Actually, the central space is the only space that is plastered all over because we really wanted to give that central space kind of the quality of an indoor room, uh, so that it has a plaster and paint on on all sides, creating that central space as a sort of uh, outdoor interior. And then we imagine that these places, these different prototypes could be placed next to each other in a form of sort of urban row, row houses, creating a sort of rhythm of these special elements uh, within uh, the fabric of the city. Another project is also low cost housing, affordable housing uh, in Denver, Colorado. Um, and in this project, um, we were asked to think together with uh, uh, continuum developers and a uh, local architecture building, uh, who, was, who was a design builder, uh, the, the uh, contractor as well on the project. Uh, and it really searches for different ways of how to densify the suburbs. There's a lot of cities in the United States that understand that there's a, a necessity to densify the suburbs that are close to the city center. Uh, and actually, many of these uh, things happening already here. You can see, for example, how several units live on our same roof in this building. Uh, but many of these policy, like small lot development policies of the cities, they generate sort of de develop developer-driven architecture that kind of seems to be completely out of touch with with a sort of a certain quality that exists in um, in in uh, suburban spaces. And so. If you look at the at the, at, the, at this, this this place in Denver, if you look across the street, the, the housing types are very diverse. One is stone, one is wood and brick, but still, even though they're like one is probably double as high as the other one, there's still a sort of uh, yeah, a sort of connection and a sort of uh, understanding of a sort of morphology that that uh, makes this neighborhood work and makes this neighborhood uh, work together. So we wanted to kind of play with that idea of the suburban house while still allowing a housing type in which, in this case eight uh, small units would share uh, one building. You see the one 50 foot lot, lot is divided into two 25 foot lots. And on each lot, we were allowed to build a front house and a small ADU or an accessory uh, dwelling unit. And so even the front house, we try to divide it up into two uh, different spaces, a little bit with a color coding, as if they were like monopoly houses. Um, um, trying to still have a sort of smaller grain of, of building on the side. And then also really thinking what can happen with this in-between, these narrow in-between spaces between buildings that though narrow, we still found that they could have a certain quality and could, could uh, allow people and these different projects to, to, to engage with each other. Here's the, the, the plan organization, this is the uh, ground floor and upper floor. And basically everything you see in yellow this kind of public space. You see the house on the right has a sort of large kitchen, a house on the left, a sort of a living room. And so the idea is that everybody has their own private unit, but still, if you want to watch a football game with friends or invite people for dinner or a birthday party, you could, you could use these shared spaces. So it's really staging or, or trying to stay as a subtle balance, balance between what is, um, what is your private, your need for privacy and the possibility of, of, of interaction. And then again, here in, in, in a project with limited space and limited budgets, I think it's again very important to create a sort of uh, uh, generosity into, into the architecture. So here we have these 20 foot long uh, counters, uh, about six, six meters of actually it's two glue lamp beams that are glued together. So it's like one continuous surface without any 
any joints in, in, in the horizontal sense or in the vertical sense as well, kind of this, this high ceiling on the pitched roof and to kind of allow um, that kind of long distances and sort of architectonical quality uh, in, this, in these spaces. In the ADU, it works differently. It's a split level system with a roll up garage door, giving it a sort of a, a, a really an, a, a, an atmosphere of sort of art space, sort of a working space, sort of work living space. And since this is the first project that I talk about today that's in the US, maybe it's important and, and, and probably suitable for a Kenneth Frampton and Doug lecture series to touch upon this friction between local and global environments. How can we as, as contemporary, as, as a Mexican office, make work that is very specific, very local, very embedded in a, in a place and still create a body of work that does not depend on place or locality? And so for us, it was really an enormous learning curve to start building in the US. In Mexico, we often rely on um, a special material quality or sort of crafty applications to, in, in the manufacturing of our work. Um, in Mexico, to build easy, sturdy, and cheap, we would build in concrete. The structure would often be also the final express, expression of the building, the structure in brick, stone, concrete, or wood. In the US, as most of our projects were relatively low budget, this whole game plan had to change. None of these strategies seemed to work. In the end, these buildings have to be puzzled together with off-the-shelf solutions. By uh, structure and finish were mostly absolutely different things. Handcrafted material quality was often replaced by choosing standard colored options out of a sales brochure or defining paint swatches. We did not find this uncomfortable or, 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 or natural, uh, in both cases, we found we had to work with local building systems and techniques. We try not to, not to judge or to have a preference of one system above the other, but rather to accept them as a given fact and to explore the possibilities, in this case of slightly uh, altering the conventions. In this case, or in this image, you see also the, the, the nondescript location of this building is important. What interests me in this project is, is how architecture can respond towards such a generic suburban environment, to accept it without being ironical about it, but rather still understanding and enhancing a certain quality it offers. The next one is a very small project in Los Angeles. Um, we were not really sure if we had to accept this, this small commission, but the client was a very interesting architecture critic, and you have to have architecture critics on your side always. <laughs> Uh, and he, he moved from being the LA Times architecture writer to a new job at the city hall. He became the inaugural LA chief design officer. So what happened at a certain moment was that all the books he had in his office at the newspaper, he had to bring it home and one way or another, he had to organize this in a new space uh, at home, a space that could also serve as a small guest pavilion. So he said, how can we make a bookshelf? And how can a bookshelf be architecture? And how how could this uh, how could this this work? Now, it, it, of course, the blue is very blue, but in the end, uh, it, it's filled with books. And it is this blue perimeter, this kind of horizon we drew in that pitched roof space that kind of defines and organizes all the different elements: the desk, the relation to the outdoors, the relation to the bathroom, etc. Uh, here, you see again uh, the desk. Everything is integrated in that very uh, basic. Uh, that basic uh, gesture that kind of makes from a nondescript space kind of tries to define a clear, a, a clear uh, element. And then the contrast between this blue orthogonally organized interior of this space and a sort of pill-shaped bathroom all wrapped in a sort of uh, in, in a very simple uh, white tile creating then sort of relationship through this continuous clear story glass frame between the two spaces. So a thin line of glass that protects the books from the humidity uh, of the bathroom. Now, when working on projects like that, uh, one always wonders, is there enough design? Did we do enough efforts to make it something special? So it's not just a building, but it's really architecture, or that it's not just a bookshelf, but it becomes really a project. 
I think we always struggle with that. Or, or maybe on the, on the other hand as well, did we too much? Did we do too much so it doesn't sit comfortable in a site anymore? Maybe it's too pretentious. It talks in unsolicited language. I think this question of, uh, is always a subtle balance we try to strike in every project. It's not about uh, less is more or less is a bore or more is more. I don't know what all variants people have been making on them lately, but it's about what is enough? How much, what is the right amount of ambition of intentions I can project into, into a project? I think that's, that's it's, it's a very interesting thing that we always discuss in the project. Uh, in the office, you know, like, did we do enough? Is it enough? This house, another house in LA, our first project we, we did in LA was um, uh, a house for a client. She, she owned a very beautiful little bungalow from the 1920s. She wanted to really re redo it and revamp it and make something more uh, worth out of it. But we were immediately interested in that building. Uh, like I said before, like not to judge it or not discuss if this is now valuable or not, but say, okay, let's say this is a given fact that talks a little bit about a moment of urbanization of the LA Hills and to see what we could do with it. Now, these bungalows are very nice because they're cozy and don't have too big windows. So there's not too much sun coming in. And on the other hand, they don't offer like what, for example, the K-Stable houses offer, no? this, this mid-century modernism where you have great relation between inside and outside uh, between the garden. So we said maybe we could kind of invent sort of device we could add towards the, the, the bungalow, and then that device could mediate between the inside and the outside, between the, 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 the protected space inside and the garden and the landscape and the view. So that's basically what we did. We add this, this basically sort of grid structure, sort of solo width like uh, a grid structure in the back of the house, uh, creating then this space that really, really talks to the landscape or, or to the horizon or to the garden and really allows this space to be to be more open. Uh, and the beauty of this is that in the end, the whole uh, uh, dimension of this whole thing was only defined by the existing difference between floor heights and that creates a, your module. And then all the decisions kind of flow out of that automatically. So if you know that this is your floor height then this will be the width and then you, you'll probably in the plan, you'll have to uh, accommodate that width. So here what happens, the whole thing peeps out from the back a little bit uh, because it, it, it doesn't really align. And I think that's that beautiful friction that then starts to exist between the existing house. Here there's a column in the middle of the expensive opening we made in the bungalow. Uh, and, and I think it's just that friction that I think we're looking for in projects to make sure that uh, uh, both elements can kind of coexist uh, and still create not an A plus B, but still create something new uh, together. Um, we often actually worked in our office with kind of, uh, I, I show actually relatively little project today, but with kind of grid structure, because we think it, 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 it's a really interesting system to work. And I just saw this uh, um, work by Louis Kamnitzer uh, a few weeks ago. It's actually on show now at the, uh, America Society, uh, and I find it a very interesting art piece because basically every aluminium plate is the same plate and it has the same type of engraving, but the only thing that really is mentioned is the position of that plate. And I think when working with grid structures in, 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 in architecture, um, it becomes really interesting to see that, that grid structures are really about the position of spaces within that in that larger thing normally when people think about architecture grid-based architecture they think about sort of autonomous architecture and architecture that refers back to the discipline to the to the to the organization something that has nothing to do with with context but just i would say i would argue is the opposite the more we use uh, that grid system it's all about context it is if every room is architecturally similar the same depth, height, width, and height, then it's not the architectural quality that differentiates between spaces, but only its position, its place. It's like a corner office. Probably all the offices are the same, but one office is different because it's a corner office. Um, oh, 
zoom in so you could read it better. Uh, rooftop Prim, this is the almost uh, the project number eight. This is a project we did in uh, Mexico City. Uh, we were very uh, uh, honored to receive an AIA New York Honor Award for it uh, this year. Um, and it's a, it's a project on top of an uh, old uh, an, an, a 19th century uh, palace in the center of Mexico City, where the client actually in a very smart way, he's been using that building as a sort of asphalt object and has been trying to uh, rent it out for parties and weddings and really understanding the quality of this, this building as a sort of, uh, a sort of uh, almost kind of vintage uh, entity, like sort of worn down entity. The only problem that he had is that a lot of times in the rain season, a rain gets into these patios and he, he cannot really organize this event or has to stop these events. So he asked us to cover these three patios with a sort of a something that will protect it for the lane, or from the rain, probably something uh, light, preferably something lightweight. So we started thinking about something. So instead of covering each and every one with a different structure, why don't we do one structure over the whole volume and so system with 50 uh, rows of little feet it could carry uh, and that could maybe even still use these spaces in between the patios as additional spaces uh, to do uh, to use uh, even when it's uh, slightly raining so you see like some construction pictures and actually the view from the inside we work with this polycarbonate panels because you really want to still see uh, a blue blue sky from within these patios and um, and to really create a sort of very open and transparent uh, uh, effect with a lot of light uh, coming down. Uh, it was really interesting for us to work with materials we were not that used to work with in the end. The floor is a, is a composite wood decking. It's all kind of uh, industrial materials, materials that have to do with uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, industrial production, um, very opposed for example, to the existing building. These are nylon nylon netting, nylon polycarbonate uh, composite wood. And um, I think in the end, it created a sort of uh, very intriguing, intriguing contrast. These actually are like nets used in the agricultural industry to create extra, extra shape. Then of course, the vegetation. Here you see, for example, the structural expansion joint over which then the polycarbonate panels could just uh, continue. Um, here you can see a little bit this contrast between these different buildings, you know, like this, uh, and how this is all made out of materials that one way or another have, are related to, uh, to, 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 to earth, to, to, uh, um, organic materials, and these are more like uh, synthetic industrial materials. And it's really interesting to see because in the daytime, these kind of cheap industrial materials, they kind of blend in with all the mess of stuff and tarps and plastic uh, rainwater stuff that's on, on all the different roofs of Mexico City, while in the night, it just becomes a sort of, a sort of a gl a glowing element that shows itself into the city. And I think what's interesting, a lot of times when you work in these historical buildings that you, that you do not discuss too much, like is this a good building or is this a bad building? Is it historic or is it valuable or not? But the success of many of these projects is to just accept the building as a given and trust that you will be able to, to deal with it one way or another. The last project is a, a project uh, we used an endowment, a, a small, uh, medium-sized office building in Texas. A competition we won in 2019 together with Kevin Daly and, and PLS, a landscape designer, and um, which is under construction now. So it's gonna be our first like larger uh, 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 building in the US. It's also semi-public building. Um, so we're very excited about this. This is this is the site, Spots Park. This, this, this uh, part of the site, it's, it's part of the Buffalo Bayou, the green belt that goes straight into the uh, downtown uh, of Houston. And this park, one of the important moments in during the competition design is what the landscape architects 
they discovered that it was not only such a bare site. It was actually very, there was a lot of, it was very forested and it was really part of that, that, that kind of long, long extension of woods uh, along the Buffalo Bayou. So we really wanted to make sure that uh, when working on this project, we could kind of at least uh, uh, redensify the perimeter of this, of this project, uh, allowing some internal meadows still to exist, but really to make sure that, that uh, we could densify again uh, this, this, this outer rim of the, of the park. And that meant that the building, which was actually had to be placed here, that that would actually become part of a wood, of a forest. It had to be one way or another, a sort of canopy. And so basically this had to be our building, something that would give continuity to that uh, circular uh, protection from this inner meadow. This is some of the uh, models we made for the competition. It becomes sort of very open scaffold, this structure, structure of, of columns and open spaces, a sort of large canopy that is carried, um, carried by these very long and slender columns, allowing both the visitors and the, of the park and the people of the Houston Endowment to basically share the same shade, the same roof structure, the same color. Same here, the same image a little bit from, from further away creating this different filigrees and different lines to protect the inside uh, from the sun and allowing different views towards the park. So this is a, a working process. Construction started a few months ago. Uh, and, and so now we're in this exciting moment where we can start uh, looking at uh, a lot of the, the facade, mark, facade markups and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the louvers. They're actually produced in Mexico by uh, Genetica a really interesting firm. And um, I wanna show you quickly as well, the mock-ups for the signage made by MG Enco, by Noemi and, and Reto, which is really beautiful. It kind of, as the building, it becomes again a sort of open structure that kind of allows the sun to play with it. And uh, I mean, no credit for me here, this is all work by MG Enco, but uh, I thought it would, would be a good way to, to end the lecture because they made ends as well. So uh, thank you so much for uh, your attention and uh, let's sit down. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie, for the talk. Good work. Thank you. Okay, I guess I, I wanted to start a little bit with, you, you know, you presented nine projects in the first image, nine squares, a grid mm -hmm. even, you know, so mm -hmm. that already, I think, gives um, a little bit of a hint and, and more than a hint to what you're uh, working on and thinking about in the work, right? So there's um, a range of projects, different scales, different types, and I, I wanted to start a little bit there. And could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on what it means to you and your office in working on and working across scales? Mm -hmm. It's funny you say the nine, the nine uh, grid, square grid, because yeah. actually I was brought up in Ghent. I mean, our, yeah. the, the pedagogy of the school where I uh, studied architecture was based on the American model of the nine square grids. So we were ba ba basically building nine square grids for the first years. Uh, uh, but scale, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's in, well, it's important and not important in the sense that, uh, as you see, I, I've showed like projects from different, different ranges going from like larger buildings to, to smaller ones. And I think in the end, um, they kind of, uh, well, I think they kind of have the same, uh, um, and drive behind it in, in one way or another. I know that there's a sort of uh, interest in a certain legitimacy and, and clarity. And uh, I, I think especially with a uh, larger scale project, now that we're working on a larger scale, this question that came up, right? did we do enough? Did we do too much? Did we do too little? It becomes very complex, I think, mm -hmm. because at a certain moment when, uh, um, when, when your buildings grow, like, Kind of allows for more experiences and more, uh, and then all of a sudden this idea that we always work with, with of this 
this clarity and this signal gesture and this one movement and this one single element that defines a project. I think now this is the moment in our, in our office where we're starting sometimes to, to question this, you know, like how can we, how can we work with that idea in, in, uh, in different projects? Yeah, I think that's, that's interesting and because there is challenges because you are scaling up. And so then I think it raises other questions around things like repetition, um, how you are working with geometry and the consequence of that ultimately in the form. Mm -hmm. um, would be interesting to hear maybe a little bit more uh, about that, how you approach things like symmetry and, and kind of precision. Yeah, form is a question that comes up often, and I, I never know, really know how to relate to form because yeah. I find it so, um, and it, it also comes up a lot in, the, in, 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 like in discussions in, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in, the, in the American uh, academy in a sense like yeah. the form finding and you know like and um, I, I never really know how to relate to it in a sense that uh, I find it evident that there's a search for for uh, for form mm -hmm. and I think our, our design process is very much um, direct towards kind of um, discovering these underlying forms within the within the within the design brief or within the program or within the um and so uh i would almost say that it's if we cannot design or if we or we can if we cannot do be specific about formal solutions but if they kind of are imposed to us it feels very comfortable you have to not to forget we're an office with four people so one way or another it's impossible to to kind of, I don't know, do a sort of formal gesture out of the out of your guts, you know, like that. that to, because in yeah. the end, and I think that's why the the the, 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 the stark or the, the 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 geometric tendency in our office comes from because geometry is like is descriptive geometry. It means you can describe it. I mean, like you can make agreements yeah. over it. You know, it's, it goes from A to B or go. And I think when we work with the with the four of us uh, on a project. I think it's a way to kind of have certain uh, uh, formal agreements, yes. and I'm not, not conceptual agreements. Really formal agreements, where like, and, and that's that's why grid systems work very well, or like always going both in planning section uh, and in plan and in section towards very basic uh, uh, geometric shapes, because it kind of allows us to to yeah to make a, an agreement between different people. Yeah, I guess that would be a nice title, formal agreements. Huh? That would be a nice title for a lecture, formal agreements. I yeah, I also that. forgot to talk about the title of the lecture. Yeah, that was one of my is, questions. Uh, which is my studio yeah. title. It's a title where I, uh, and then when I was preparing my lecture yesterday, I kind of said, oh yeah, I started thinking about other things and I completely forgot about the title. <laughs> but on the way on the way here, uh, because yes, you know how it goes. Titles, we discussed mm -hmm. this, Hillary. Yes, Titles, yes. they ask you yeah. like four months beforehand <laughs> the title of your lecture. So I, I don't really know what I want to talk about today. But I think the unadapted is really still very a really interesting theme. And, and I, I'm very happy that uh, also even uh, tangentially we're working on it with the students. Uh, because it's it's the opposite of, or, of, of, of the idea of flexibility in architecture. You know, like the idea that architecture has to be Mm -hmm. adaptable and moldable so it can kind of take up changes over time mm -hmm. and kind of a sort of ambition of architecture to to always work mm -hmm. and to always be adapted to the program mm -hmm. and i think it's it, i think we have to think the other way around we just have to mm -hmm. accept that architecture is never adapted to the program and that the building is never and 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 i think the moment you 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 accept that as a given or you even celebrate it as a given i think that's the beauty of so much of these adaptive reuse projects, all of a sudden the things don't really fit, um, then I think, I don't know, I think you can start thinking about architecture in, in a different way, where there's a sort of different fits between function and program, and, and then and the, the architecture as itself, as a sort of physical construct, becomes then again very, uh, very important, I think. Uh, and, and that's what I like a lot about this, this idea of sort of uh, unadaptedness. Yeah, that sounds good. I, I was also curious about maybe just could you talk a little bit about working across um, 
I guess I have two questions really, and they're both about kind of working, I think, and the kind of method and the way of working and thinking through your projects, because they're in, in all cases, you're working on different climates. And in almost all of the projects, maybe with the exception of the private house, but it, there's still moments of that, but uh, more so as you're working in public projects and thinking about making public space and the kind of production of public space, cultural space, maybe they would talk a little bit about the intersection between those two things, between climate, between the kind of public space. I think also, I mean, there's some projects you didn't show, you know, the kind of public park, um, or maybe even, yeah, but I'll stop there. But yeah, uh, and there's a lot of projects I didn't show. Yeah. That's what yeah. when you introduced me, you said, oh, and the book, I said, oh, I forgot to talk about the book. And then you said, and then, and then this, and I said, oh, I forgot to talk about that. Because, of course, we have Liga as well, our space for architecture, which is, did, did this book being the mountain, which fits perfectly in, in the mm -hmm. Kenneth Frampton in that lecture series, you know, like, um, and um, I, especially, I mean, if you ask me for the difference between the public and the private, I mean, I, I think there's a, I think there's, just, there's different ambitions, I mm -hmm. think, that are at stake when designing mm -hmm. uh, 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 public buildings uh, than, than when, doing, when doing private commissions. And I think that's the reason, or at least why we in our office are so excited to be able to work on public, projects or like the Houston Endowment, which is not really a public project, but, but it's an organization. Mm -hmm. It's actually a private lot in that park. The upper part of that park mm -hmm. is, is a private lot. So it's actually a private building on a private lot, but still due to its position in a sort of public realm, it, 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 it has to be, I mean, it, it immediately creates a relation to, to, to mm -hmm. publicness. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are very, the stakes are like slightly higher or something the moment you work on a public building and i think that 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 makes it uh, i think that makes it uh, uh, very exciting because it can have a sort of a life that is completely uh, has completely uh, that's even less predictable mm -hmm. than than doing uh, uh, private infrastructure and it's also if you don't make public infrastructure you can never bring people to your building mm -hmm. <laughs> that's also a problem that we see you know like it's kind of really nice to be able to to have your architecture out there. I think. I think. I mean, it seems as though also the, um, you know, I'm struck by the Denver housing um, and the ability to create such an open space at the ground floor, even though it's still contained and everyone has their own unit. But to have that inner uh, life and exchange across units and. Um, almost a kind of subdivision of property um, in the context of understanding the kind of historical division of lots mm -hmm. and uh, ownership and those who don't have ownership access and, um, you know, it's kind of turning the block, or the, sorry, not the block, I'm back too much this semester, the lot inside out. Um, and to reveal, you know, I think a little bit, you maybe said somewhere along the way, some kind of friction, friction, you were talking about friction between local and global, but, you know, it's quite interesting to think in that project, just the kind of friction that gets created within one lot um, and really undoing um, the way that we have thought of housing in the US, um, mm -hmm. maybe through that example. I mean, I when I talked about like trying to play a little bit with these conventions, that, that that's, I mean, sometimes there's this, like these rare opportunities, like we had that in, that in one way or another, you're allowed to design two houses at the same time. So it's like imagining that you, that you're working on a suburban lot, but you can design the house of your neighbor and your own house at the same time. And so uh, that became like really, really an important drive for us in this project. So like what, what I mean, we could make a sort of pilot project and say two 25 foot wide pilot projects, but, but no, it was just that weird given that all of a sudden this lot line, as you say, kind of disappears. And, and that that could be a sort of drive of a, of, a, of a project where if you go and watch TV, you go to the neighbor's house. Yeah. And if you go and if your neighbor goes and organize a dinner party. And so, so it's, it's also not obvious at all. It means that it's really like two houses that are managed or like kind of living together in a sort of agreement. Yeah. Um, so I think, 
I think trying to find out in every project where the anomaly of the project lies or what mm -hmm. makes that project different than every other project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and for example, going back to your previous question, I find that often very difficult in, in residential projects and private projects, you know, because mm -hmm. they, they, they um, to kind of really understand, okay, if we work on a, on a remodel of a house in LA, mm -hmm. what makes it so special? There's like, like there's hundreds of remodels being mm -hmm. done by architects. How, how can this lot and this plot or this, 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 mm -hmm. this client, I, I don't like to place the, the, the specialty on the client a lot because I think I want, I want to put it into the architecture and mm -hmm. not into the person that lives in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is really, uh, I think that's that same idea of unearthing a little bit what is there and to see what, what quality you can find. Yeah, well, very that, interesting. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, I think that the uh, library and the book it's beautiful, and even in that, I just kept looking at the work and thinking about um, each project has this kind of set of lines, um, whether it is the kind of structural grid, uh, you know, the kind of wood slats. Just thinking of looking at the work um, as drawings which you showed very little of, mm -hmm. which is interesting. And we get some models at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, have, I've been to your office in Mexico City. I don't know if you know that. But, um, and, you know, seeing the models in the space and um, just thinking about how there is a, this, um, you know, this kind of intense uh, pursuit of, it is in a way a kind of, geometric representation, a kind of structural is always visible and visual, um, even you know, to the representation of the lines becoming three-dimensional, almost more like a corduroy across some mm -hmm. of the facades that there's depth to it. And I was thinking a little bit in the Denver project, not, not to sort of fixate on that in any way, but even when you were talking about the economy of it and um, that almost as little as possible somehow um, to what you do, you still find ways that um, the, the, the joists are exposed and you see those as lines. And it just that you, you can, there's variety and diversity in the work across the types and the scales, but I, you're trying to find a way to maybe say something about stringing them all together whether or not that's necessary, but there is this there's a kind of line that seems to emerge in the, the kind of pattern, and, which is, I think, quite beautiful. Sort of material um, depth, you mean, or this yeah, quality and then also, that, that's, that's related in yeah. directly to the architectural drawing. Mm -hmm. Potentially, mm -hmm. that there yeah, is there is something and that becomes mm -hmm. um, real. And so when you start to overlay those together, it's interesting to see what maybe can, you know, can kind of emerge, but that there's still so much in the built work that is separates it from the drawing, right? And mm -hmm. so where do we find surprise? Um, I think we've relied so much on renderings to tell us what we're going to see. And uh, I think in the case that you present the work through the built work and then through some models and almost very few renderings, or if anything, think about the uh, drawing from a pan and you show us that, that repetition, but it's more in a relief even is quite beautiful. So. It's true, I showed very little plans today, for yeah. example, and yeah. I think it, it, you can see in, in the architecture, it's a very, I don't know, another drawing-based architecture. You can also, yeah. I think, uh, if you if you read through it, through our architecture, you could even see that we draw in 2D AutoCAD and not in Rhino, for example. You know, like, yeah. I think that are things that, that is part of a sort of uh, way of, making architecture that uh, I, I'm absolutely convinced that that generates a type of architecture. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. And uh, I, I never thought it about it in that way, but it, it, it's, it's, really, it, it's really true. Um, well, but it's, uh, yeah, but I wanna be careful because I'm not suggesting that there's some sort of limitation in ultimately what gets made, but we know that in drawing in 2D, there, there are limits to that. We were talking about that today. No, but it's not a limitation yeah. or I don't see it as a, as a problem. It's just really, um, it's a, it's a way of, of uh, I would say it's a way of being comfortable us like in drawing such a way, you know, like actually I would even say like in between the four partners, we would have like kind of uh, different ways of, I, I'm a plan drawer, you know, like I draw, I, li I like to figure things out in plan. While if, for example, immediately I, I would have, 
uh, Victor, for example, drawing a section or like immediately reading sections of, 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 of what I would draw. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think everybody finds a little bit his own tools in, in architectural production, mm -hmm. you know, like that. And, and I think that the final result, the buildings that come out of it is, of course, mm -hmm. the direct translation of that, of that I, of, uh, not of that idea of that method of working. I would say exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, maybe we should move to, I have other questions, but maybe we could move to the audience. Any questions? I don't know, Lila, if there's anything in the chat. Okay. Hi, thank you. It was a really great lecture. Um, so, I'm really struck by how I think I see like lots of thresholds in your work. You create these thresholds. You guys have these like moments of these zones of, I, you talked about this public, private, inside, outside. And I'm, it's like they, that you, you sort of defined the, the zones so well that the thresholds themselves become this negotiation for strangers, really. Like you sort of trust the people who are inhabiting these spaces to make the decisions. And I wonder in your design process, how much do you acknowledge this uncertainty? Like how much do you, I, I, only because I'm aware that you, you also have mentioned you don't want to over-design anything, right? Mm -hmm. Or over-constrain something. So how much do you think about this like space in between spaces? Um, and when do you, when are moments where you feel, okay, maybe this is enough you know, maybe we shouldn't touch this with more material or we shouldn't constrain it in, in different ways. Uh, first of all, thanks for going first. It's always brave. <laughs> uh, um, I, I can, I can, the way I hear you speak, I think you have a very specific thing in, 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 your, in your mind as well, no? A specific project. Can you, can you help me to kind of figure there's it like, out? There's like three of them. <laughs> huh? There's like three of them. There's the, the one that you did with Moss, um, with the arch, uh -huh. that interior. That's one threshold, I think. And then there's the other, the um, the bungalow, that um, the addition that I feel is a threshold between the outside and in the house, the mm -hmm. middle negotiation bit. And um, I don't know, I think there's another one as well, but I can't. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but in both cases, they're private spaces in the end. You know, like I, I had this question a lot of, of times in lectures, like people say, oh, it's very weird because people, they go to the kitchen for a glass of water at night and they're outside, you know, like, and so it's a, it's a very open space, very related to the, uh, but but in rural Mexico, it is very open. Normal people would have a lot of land. They would have a grandmother's bedroom there and I would have a little kitchen there. And, you know, like it is a very open. And I think um, um, uh, yeah, in, in those, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, worried or anything about uh, the, uh, or I, I don't really understand uh, exactly the, where, where the question goes to, um, but but I, I do think they're very specific spaces. And a lot of times when people talk about that openness between inside and outside, uh, the people talk, yeah, we, we blur the boundaries, that's the word always, we blur the boundaries. And I said, yeah, but apart from blurring the boundaries, maybe I don't think I'm, for example, in both the cases you mentioned, I think you said it well, you can this clearly define these spaces. No, it's not blurring the boundaries. It's really, uh, although although it might have the same effect one way or another, it's really like creating a sort of new space that is nor inside nor outside. And to also architectonically define that space and to see what we can do with that space. I think that's what we're really, really interested in uh, because, um, I think that's a little bit, in our way of working at least, the, the, the challenge to be able to draw hard lines on paper. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we will never, we will, so, so and, and it makes architecture very difficult. Because not, yeah, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. No, no, it, every time you have to think, okay, where is it? Where does it stop and where does it end? Because we draw in such a, uh, uh, I don't know, our way of working is just that, that things are aligned and things are, are defined as a space. But it becomes always a, a very difficult task. And I think that's, that, that's, that's interesting, of course. Other questions?
Amen. Hi, I want to thank you very much for the lecture. It was a pleasure. Um, I have a question um, to, to, because I want to invite you to talk further about the title. I think it's a very provocative and very interesting title. And uh, you gave an answer in relation with, uh, probably it was an answer relate, in relation to an academic uh, disciplinary conversation. And I'm saying this because not to be adapted, not to conform, uh, is to be against something. And uh, in most cases is to raise a political voice against something, right? It's uh, an action that allows us to understand social neglection, for instance, and many other uh, attitudes, uh, basically not to conform. Um, and I'm saying this because you have uh, given an, uh, an argument that clearly um, was responding to a disciplinary uh, discourse, to an academic disciplinary discourse. But as you were mentioning, architectural is contextual, right? So I understand that respond here at GISAP, but how would you respond in relation, for instance, to the US context or to the Mexico context? So what, what do you, you don't want to be adapted to in the US and why you don't want to be adapted to in Mexico? And with that, which is your uh, critical position in both territories? Yeah, I, I, th I think it's very funny, Anna, because I think it's an excellent question. And I actually, I was already thinking a little bit about it, and I was thinking about it in relation to your lecture from a week or two ago, because there is a very different, um, there's a very different uh, attitude, I think, uh, in, in, um, in the way we would uh, both react to certain given uh, situations and when I was uh, when I was at your lecture a week or two ago, I was really almost jealous or like kind of excited by the way that you always were like not accepting the condition and there was always a way to go against it and to kind of subvert the things in a in a in a, in a different way. And I think, uh, and I hope I understand the question well. I think um, one way or another, I think we 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 kind of do the opposite. We say, okay, this is. Okay, this is this is how things are. Let's just accept them the way you are, the way they are, and let's keep that as a starting point to kind of see where can we twist things, where can we, um, um, how can we find uh, uh, new solutions or possibilities that create a certain friction that, uh, uh, but but within the framework of of accepting it, and I think uh, that question that you asked me keeps me very restless sometimes. You know, like. So where do we have to kind of accept that? Uh, 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 yeah, that that that, uh, that given context, and not uh, and not first try to go against certain things we don't agree with before before really trying to play with it. You know, like and um, um, I was also thinking, you know, like I mean. If there's, if, there, if there's one thing super important uh, about, of course, I've been thinking about Frampton in preparation of this lecture, but there's something very important about Frampton's work, you know, like for the last, uh, let's say 40, 40 years. It's, it's exactly that idea of resistance, you know, like how to create a sort of architecture uh, that kind of uh, do not, does not accept the status quo of the, of the, of the, of the local or global conditions as a as a starting point, and I think um, yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a yeah, sort of fine line we always we always try to uh, to play with, always to subvert things in a sort of uh, um, I would say in an intelligent way, in a sort of provocative way, uh, in order to to kind of understand. Uh, Kind of show actually the conditions the way they are like the suburban mm -hmm. housing the world mm -hmm. we were talking mm -hmm. about just uh, just just now other questions yeah for sure 
I think we were maybe a couple of questions ago, just starting to talk a little bit about collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that process, maybe first between the four of you and the kind of working method. And um, because you, are, you started to say you work in plan, I don't remember now if you said Carlos or someone responded in section. Is there a kind of method? Maybe you don't want to reveal anything either, but. Um, no, it's not that we have a magic <laughs> trick that we don't yeah. want to share with our audience. But it, is there, you know, how does it, do you all come together at the same time? Do you, you know, I think just it's helpful for the students to, because we do a lot of collaboration in the school, I think is, is you know, we're teaching collaboratively in many ways as well. And so, how do you begin to enter into a conversation and and particularly I think I kind of keep returning to the scales or the the types but um, you know it's it's very interesting to me to see how particularly in housing how you can have that work being done along other types of work in the office um, and especially as you're showing you know pictures of the office which is such an exciting space around a big table everything is open you know when you at least my experience when I was in your office, you know, kind of walking around, bumping into the tables at the side. You know, we didn't talk at, at all about the furniture and objects, but it's very much part of the, the office and the experience. And so I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you work collaboratively? Um, and I think also you're working collaboratively, you know, with Kevin in Houston, uh, you know, with Tatiana, with us, you know, we've had um, opportunities to have exchanges and what that means for practice more largely? Well, I, I think, I mean, it, it means, it, it, I think it's at the core of our practice one way or another. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, it, it also questions the idea of authorship a lot. You know, like I would say like collaborating with, with people outside of, of the office is kind of an extension of what we do inside the office in the sense that we feel very, uh, so, so it's very easy for us, you know, like if we all of a sudden uh, do a project with another architect instead of talking to three people, which would be the three people of my office. I would be talking to four people, which doesn't make a lot of difference, you know. Like so, so since uh, the design process is already a relatively collaborative effort, I think like bringing other people into the mixture is is uh, is very easy. I think the reason why we're comfortable uh, working together is is, um, and I must say now the, the office is growing now that I'm you know, spending a lot of time in the U.S. as well. Uh, 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 teaching and working and living here with my family, uh, we have to really fight hard to kind of make sure that we still have enough moments that the four of us, or at least a critical mass of the four of us, two or three at least, are, and that we don't start like taking a project by ourselves. Because we really believe that um, that that's where the, 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 yeah, the power of our office lies, and the, the, the design quality. You know, like, and of course it's slow, and of course it's tedious. Anna, you know, you have also an office with several uh, collaborators. Uh, but but still, I think by like having a lot of forts and back already on the design table and different points of view, uh, I think that that becomes a really uh, crucial uh, a crucial part of the of, of the design. Uh, and there was something else that I that I want to react to, but I forgot what it was. Uh, well, I think just how you how you maybe it's a method and and working and well, I think and, that you mentioned the table. I mean, yeah. for real, the, the design table is really important. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why we, for example, we we say we don't look at rendering so much because we have to look at the screen and we don't fit four of four sure. people around the screen. You know, yeah. like you, so what works very well is models or drawings because you can put them on a table and we can sit around it. Uh, and and uh, and and so, for example, I I don't know like the, the typical. Um, David Bird play cards where you would like they would say like bass player uh, yeah. pass the guitar yeah. onto you know like <laughs> like the typical architect's trick would be like turn your plan around you know look yeah. at it from another angle and then I think we we always already have that if once when we're looking at a at a model on the design table in a, in a dialogue and discussion I'm already seeing a different part of the model than my partner is sitting at the other part of the table or or, or my collaborator who's sitting there. Yeah. And I think, um, well, I think that's really, I think that's really, um, uh, yeah, crucial to have a design process in which, like, these different, not only different voices and different people, but also different uh, uh, simultaneous views are are, 
of residents. Mm -hmm. Any any projects that really have brought you joy? Um, no, not yet. Not yet. No, oh. no I think you can't say uh, all. <laughs> uh, Something in particular. No, I I wonder what kind of is the most like rewarding or the most the most, yeah. and I think I, I one would kind of expect like the final built product or the mm. uh, for me it's the opposite mm -hmm. you know like when the, when a building is finished it's always i don't know there's always several worries and i know it's something's could have done better or this mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really after a long t time or when we finish a book it's the same thing i never like it when we make a book mm -hmm. so like a year later i start liking it and i say oh it was actually a really good book you know like it's too fresh yeah. i think what i really really enjoy is the is that moment at the design table when we're like struggling and we have three or three weeks that we don't know how to resolve the project. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, there's always a moment, or sometimes more, but there's mostly always a moment yes. when something comes up and everybody knows that it's, mm -hmm. that that's the right solution, yeah. that it's gonna work. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's super fulfilling. And then it's just like, you have to just produce it, you know, like, and, and I think, uh, I think that that moment of of kind of being lost. I always tell my students that they have to allow themselves to be lost in their project. Mm -hmm. That moment of being lost and all of a sudden kind of mm -hmm. managing to tie the, mm -hmm. the 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 ends together again. I think that that that's very yeah. satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. Any other last questions? I have one. It seems like there is a very consistent effort in building all of the projects up or across skills that there you are preserving certain quality that belongs to your practice, belong to your firm. What, what would you in words describe that? Like how would you, how do you want your firm to be perceived? To be perceived? Mm -hmm. um, that's a very difficult question, I think. Uh, but when we're working now for 15 years, so people have also been, uh, I don't know, telling us how they perceive us, you know, like, so slowly, bit by bit, we're kind of starting to understand. Uh, um, but I, uh, I mean, I'm gonna now kind of read you the elevator pitch on the first top right part of my website, you know, like, but, but I think there, there's, cert, there's, a, there's really an interest in like, making buildings that are legible and legible, I mean, like understandable at, 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 at a lot of levels. So I think that's the beauty of a, of a, of a, of a project. And for me, a lot about, about architecture that, uh, that the project is legible when I try to, it doesn't mean understandable, you know, like it doesn't mean like, oh, every layman can understand what this mm -hmm. is about, but it's a, it's a sort of, it is sort of a, a, a manifestation of clear intentions and, 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 and clear goals. And I think that allows people to kind of react to, to the architecture in, in a very direct way, you know, to really, to, to enjoy it. And maybe even also to critique it or to kind of, if you draw a hard line, people can discuss it. The lines will not be more on the left or, or on the right. And so it kind of allows people to engage very easily with the architecture. And I think, and I think that's for me, and that's also that why it's an architecture that is easy to to explain or to discuss with mm -hmm. possible clients or with, with your partners on the design mm -hmm. table, because since since we we oblige ourselves to make very precise definitions, um, it also I think it allows discussion and it allows reaction too. And I think I think that's that's I think something that I, I, I was very happy with. Thank you for asking the question. Mm -hmm. um, has there ever been a moment when, you know, I, I'm not sure how the group dynamic works within your firm, um, especially with four people leading. Has there ever been a moment that you've sort of conceded um, either an idea or, or a form that uh, you later realized that um, you know, in in the creation and the actual formation of um, that piece uh, within your work, uh, you wish you hadn't conceded that and, and sort of 
If so, um, how do you resolve uh, issues like that? It happens all the time, but at the same time, and that's the beauty of, 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 of our discipline, it's such a slow process architecture that I think um, you never kind of, oops, make a mistake and then that thing is built or something, you know, like, so I think a lot of times there's some things that you kind of understand that maybe that wasn't, that, that there's certain things you understand, especially when you go to a building site, as architects, we're trained to looking at plans and sections and renderings to kind of imagine what the built building will look like. That's never really the case. You know, like every time you go to a building site, you're like surprised. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't, oh, I didn't expect this. And I think since, since it's such a slow process, if there's things that are not, um, and that goes for the design process, just as for the building process, if there's things that are uh, uh, decisions that are maybe were probably not as smart, I think there's always a moment to adjust it or to reincorporate it into a, into a different solution. Uh, like the tattoo you make looks like an ex-girlfriend and then later you change it into a bird or something, you know, like there's always kind of a possibility to kind of correct and to, and I think that's, I think that's, uh, I think that's very interesting. It's just the slowness, I think, I think that's something uh, that, I, that I spoke about as well. I think the moments where you are allowed to be slow, which happens less and less in a sort of hard market-driven architectural <laughs> environment. Uh, the moment where you're allowed to sort of slowness to rethink things, to reconsider things, I think it's very beautiful. I get very nervous, for example, oh, agony, the opposite yeah. of joy, you know, like I get very nervous yeah. nowadays when projects are defined with a sort of very straight timeline as if architecture is sort of linear process where you kind of have after uh, schematic design and DD, as if DD is just a rollout of, a, of this SD. No, no, in DD you have to reconsider everything it is in SD. And, and I, uh, and so, I, so I think that's very important, that possibility to, to rethink and reconsider and, and, and readjust every mistake you did in, in the previous phase. Thank you. And there were no questions from the chat. I want to say thank you as well to Lila that yeah. organized this whole evening. I know it's your last day. So yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. For thank you, Lila. I was going to mention that. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, Juan, for sharing your amazing work uh, with your office with us tonight. It's a crowning lecture. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you.